Hello, this is uh, Dr. Abraham Weisfeld uh, in um, Montreal, Quebec, Canada, speaking with Eric Grotsky in the United States of America. And uh, Eric is a uh, member of the Jewish uh, Socialist Bund. And uh, we're uh, very interested in speaking with him because he's also uh, philosophically and uh, religiously Muslim, as well as being Jewish. And uh, so provides a very interesting bridge to the uh, Muslim world, you know, from the uh, Jewish uh, Socialist Bund, which is, of course, anti Zionist. And, uh, and note, uh, Eric, that uh, the video that we made uh, the previous week uh, introducing you uh, has uh, secured uh, 46 uh, views um, as of today. And uh, it's one of the most success more successful videos that I that I have posted on my YouTube channel, Abraham Weisfeld. So that's why, you know, uh, we should uh, be doing the uh, recording today as well, because people are interested in hearing from you. There was one comment that was made uh, on Facebook asking for uh, further elaboration from your part, because what he, he had heard from you didn't, uh, you know, satisfy him. He wants to know more about you. So let's begin with that. Uh, uh, how, in particular, uh, do you view yourself as a Muslim, how you became Muslim, and uh, what it means uh, for you to be a, a Jewish Muslim? Okay, so I became Muslim 10, oh, oh sorry, not 10 years ago, 11 years ago on a, at a community day event. What's that? Town. A community day event in your town? Yeah. And... Um, I had a friend who was Turkish. She's a Muslim, and uh, she converted me over. And that that, that same day, I actually I actually uh, registered to become Republican that day, which is really weird. But anyway, that's just uh, that's all. I'm not I'm affiliated with anything like that anymore. But um, I uh, did a lot of stuff. Like I I try to read, I try to learn the Quran. It's some still it's a learning in progress. It'll take time. And it's it's unfortunate. It takes time, but you know. And um, how I became Muslim, like uh, like my 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 motivations for becoming Muslim, like I believe in one God. I mean, I know Judaism believes in the same thing, oneness of God and stuff like that. But I look for like a, a inner peace, as say so to say. But um, yeah, it, it was a, it was a cool experience come turning Muslim and stuff like that. And um, now I I just I'll talk about my Jewish background too, right? Yes. Um, my family is, my family was in the Holocaust, actually, I actually lost some members because of the, the genocide in the Holocaust. You, you, you repeat that again, because uh, your American accent, I think, is difficult for other people, including me. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I have family members that were di died in the Holocaust. Family members? How many? I don't know. My, my dad never told me how many, but it, I found out that from my mom, uh -huh. I thought, you should and, um, speak to him about that. You know, the, the, you could be very surprised. You know, when I did a, interviews with my my parents, you know, my mother started lifting, listing off the names of uh, all the brothers and sisters in her family and all their children, each of whom had, you know, about 10 children. And the names kept on going on and on, like about 30 minutes, you know, the names she was giving me, all of whom, you know, had been killed, murdered, and burnt. You know, Auschwitz-Birkenau from uh, Warsaw. You could be very surprised. It's it's a very revealing to do such interviews with your parents. Mm. My mom told me about that. Like I have Hungarian blood. Uh, 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 that area. I have also Lithuanian, I believe. I'm Polish and Russian too. Uh -huh. So that 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 Jewish side is from that area. Is. Yes. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. It, it was all a uh, except for Hungary. In Hungary, they didn't speak in Yiddish. But in the other Slavic countries, they did speak Yiddish, and each uh, city had an accent of its own, a dialect of its own. And from listening to another person speaking Yiddish, you can tell from which city that they came from. You know, it, it was <laughs> a very sort of, you know, like um, internal kind of a knowledge that uh, existed in the Jewish political culture of that time. But very advanced politically, you know, gave rise to the Jewish Bund and... Uh, you know, all the Jewish workers were socialists as well <laughs> and formed, uh, you know, the Jewish Bund at that time, you know, even in, uh, you know, uh, the early days, you know, 1910 to 1917, 
you know, the Jewish Bund, you know, had 35,000 members and the uh, Iskra group of Lenin had only 8,000 members. <laughs> so that's why Lenin was so angry with the Bund, you know, he even made some anti-Semitic remarks in his writings. But uh, they, uh, uh, this I think was one reason, you know, why they didn't want to tolerate uh, the Jewish Bund as a member of the Second International and they voted against its accept acceptance. Uh, and the Bund Mensheviks also voted against accepting the Jewish Bund in the 1903 <clears throat> International, Second International Congress. And uh, I think that the reason would have been, you know, that it would have upset the balance of power between the Iskra group and the, uh, and the uh, Bernsteinites, you know, uh, of the social democracy in the Second International because they were sort of, you know, split evenly and the Bund, you know, would have upset, you know, all this sort of, you know, like machinations that they were going through in, in the International. So the Bund didn't get included. And then when the Bolsheviks did take power in 1921, guess what? They banned the Bund. <laughs> and they oh, banned wow. it. Yeah. They banned the Bund, you know, as well as the shutting down synagogues and stuff. Then they allowed the uh, opening of the um, uh, Russian uh, uh, Catholic churches, uh, Orthodox they're called. Russian Orthodox churches were allowed to open, but not the synagogues. And then a year later, after the Bund was banned, the Zionists were banned, you know, so they had a, Bolsheviks had more of an affinity with the Zionists than they did with the Bund. <laughs> Incredible history. Wow. Yeah. Oh, there's more, you know, Eric, you wouldn't believe it. In 1939, you know, when um, uh, the uh, uh, Stalinist regime, I won't, I won't call it Soviet anymore because they shut down the Soviets in 1926, even though the name of the country is Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. You know? <laughs> All that was, you know, shut down. And in, uh, when the, Bund the Bundes, you know, uh, leaders uh, started a committee uh, uh, what, uh, in opposition to Nazism, uh, 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 Jewish Committee Against Fascism. And uh, the two leaders, you know, Alter and Ehrlich, were arrested by the Stalinist regime, put into prison because they started a committee that was opposed to, you know, the, the Russian government uh, policy because they just made a deal with the uh, Nazis, the uh, Rubentrop Molotov deal, in which uh, you know, Russia was helping Nazi Germany to rebuild its military even as in oh. sort of, a, yes, a supposed pact against, uh, you know, France and, and, and Britain. <laughs> well, you know, of course, uh, the uh, Nazi regime, you know, had no intention of, you know, keeping peaceful relations with Russia. And as soon as they could, they attacked in 19, 1941, after dividing Poland between uh, the Nazi regime and and Russia, and then, uh, you know, they killed, uh, you know, like uh, 20,000 Russian civilians, 8,000, uh, uh, sorry, 20 million Russian civilians, 8, 000, 8 million Russian soldiers died. And mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of an equal number uh, of uh, German soldiers who died, you know, in the whole, in the whole war as well. But uh, 20,000 Russian uh, civilians died, needlessly, you know, because they, they, you know, believed uh, Hitler's promise not to invade uh, the Soviet Union. Pathetic, really pathetic. Mm -hmm. So all of this, uh, you know, is uh, not known. Uh, even in the Jewish uh, culture, you know, there, you know, only Zionist history is taught in the Jewish schools mostly, except for the uh, Jewish Workers Circle, which have their own school, the Parrot School, and they teach a bit of Yiddish and a bit of, you know, more of a Jewish history. But this is something that, you know, you should be aware of, you know, so I'm telling you, others, you know, should be aware of this, the importance of the Bund, even though, you know, most of the members, you know, were killed off by the Nazis, but that doesn't diminish the political significance of the Jewish Bund before the Second World War, which, you know, was the, uh, the you know, the, the, uh, the political party that won the Jewish municipal elections and uh, formed, uh, 17 out of the 20 seats in the Jewish council in Warsaw. And the Zionists, you know, they, they only had 8% support, you know, whereas the Jewish Bund had 35% support. Then there was Jewish Orthodox parties. There was other parties like the Jewish Autonomous. There's so much to Jewish political culture that's not known. There's a territorialist, 
there's you know so many different political tendencies, all of which were you know washed away by the Zionist you know machine. So, um, but um, you being Jewish, uh, did you get any uh, Jewish? You, I don't suppose you had any Jewish school education like me. You know, like no, no it's rare. Yeah. And you certainly don't speak Yiddish, you know, like me, because I'm second generation. My parents didn't even speak English when I was born, so they had to speak to me in Yiddish. And then I kept on speaking Yiddish with them, even when they learned English, because I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to lose the, uh, the Yiddish. So I, I'm still fluent in Yiddish. But um, I don't know, in terms of uh, what must Islam means, you know, uh, when I was a political prisoner in Ottawa, Canada, I did a protest against the U.S. cruise missile. Eventually got put into prison, you know, because they didn't know what to do with me, you know, because I wouldn't leave the protest on the Parliament Hill. <laughs> so when I was in prison, um, the librarian came by and she had a copy of the Koran on the, on the uh, cart. And she asked me what book I wanted to read next. And I was in solitary confinement because actually I was in, on a hunger strike, you know, because... Uh, there was no other way to protest against the renewal of the cruise missile tests in Western Canada in the wintertime to see, you know, if it could fly over the North Pole and attack uh, Russia from behind, you know, with nuclear bombs. Okay, so I was uh, opposing this. And so I got, I got the Koran from her and I read it while I was in solitary confinement, you know, every day I had nothing else to do. And uh, while on a hunger strike, you know, really very mystical experience. I read the whole Quran in five days. Then, you know, I found it interesting. I found it, you know, to be very much, you know, like Judaism, you know, because I've read a lot of Ju Judaic texts. And it was very similar in its, in its you know, like um, in its approach, you know, and, and the way in which it was thinking, you know, I could feel the thinking that came from behind, you know, the Quran in, in terms of, you know, Muhammad himself. So that one I found very interesting, but, what I've been lacking is to understand that, you know, so much of Islam is in the hadiths, you know, the commentaries and the uh, fragments, you know, that were copied down, you know, by um, uh, Aisha, one of his wives, you know, who copied down a lot of this, inf this information. So I'm trying to find, you know, these hadiths to see, you know, what uh, is uh, going on there, you know, because I think there's much more content to be learned, you know, from Islam, but I've never been able to find those those writings yet. So, you know, that's what I know about uh, Islam myself. And I appreciate, you know, that you do have, you know, a deeper appreciation of Islam than uh, I do myself. But I think that um, there is, you know, reason and, and credibility, you know, for what you are thinking. And I think there is even a, um, an organized tendency, which is worldwide in Islam called, um, Sufism, which has an appreciation of Judaism to the same extent that you do, and yet is Islam as well, Islamic. So I think that there's a, a lot of research, research to be done in that, uh, in that vein. And uh, I think that uh, we can uh, proceed to do that together and find out you know, what's going on there so that we can uh, um, provide a uh, conception of Islam that is not incompatible with Judaism and uh, with Jewish people, and also to uh, enrich uh, the knowledge that Judaism has uh, collected as well, because I think that uh, Islam has, has uh, uh, extrapolated the Judaism into something that is much more elaborate, and much more detailed, because uh, there's so much, you know, that comes from uh, the hadiths uh, of uh, Muhammad, I understand, in, in terms of, you know, living style and how to live well and how to eat, etc. All of these things, you know, are uh, put into a greater degree of precision uh, than uh, you would find in the Quran itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, when, uh, how, what kind of reaction do you get from other people that you have met that you talk about um, Islam and and, uh, and being Jewish with? What kind of reactions? What is the political culture of your American uh, community? And uh, how does it uh, reflect on uh, both um, Islam and Jude and uh, Jewishness? What, has anybody uh, attacked you or, or anything like that? 
No, I've never been attacked, actually. I mean, I've been called a terrorist before, but other than that, I've never been really attacked. <laughs> well, that sounds like an attack. That's a verbal attack. That's like a threat that they would want to um, have done with you and either get rid of you by putting you into prison or by uh, removing you. <laughs> That's what, you know, somebody calling somebody else a terrorist means. You know, it's a, it's a death threat. You know, I think you should, you should take such things seriously. Especially oh, I did. I did actually. I was, uh, I was working in a supermarket and then someone called me a terrorist and I was clicking carts. And I told my, my boss, my went to management, told them they were very upset about it. Oh, okay. Good. Good. You went for uh, support. That's the way to do it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You don't have to sort of, you know, try to retaliate or respond, you know, by yourself. No, I, all I, alone. Was, I was just not retaliating. I told, I told him to have my stay and everything like that. Yeah. So why did this guy, you know, call you a terrorist? Because you were wearing a. Uh, your Islam uh, skull cap, or, or yeah, what? The, yeah, I was wearing that. Yeah, uh huh. I have uh, two of those actually uh, that I wear for uh, sleeping at night to keep my head warm. <laughs> They're very convenient. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had a rough time being Jewish, you know, in Anglo uh, Toronto. So that's why I was thinking that you would have a, a rough time uh, in the United States, that it could even be uh, worse. And what have I, what I had there, Yeah, there are, there are plenty of Jewish sites near, uh, to, like temples near me. Like there's Beth Israel and there's this cultural center, which is in Cherry Hill, which is actually has the Zionist flag flying above it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it's, very, it's very upsetting. Yeah, same here in Toronto and uh, Montreal. Yeah, they still have an Israel flag there. There's a campaign to uh, get them to take down those flags, you know, because they don't, they're not representative of the Jewish community and they violate, uh, the the uh, political beliefs of uh, of so many Jewish people who don't consider themselves to be Zionists, you know. So why should they have to go under an Israel flag to get into a Jewish community center? It's not an Israel community center. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, um, the uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum here in Montreal is located in the Jewish community center, you know, behind the uh, Israel flag. But the um, Holocaust Memorial uh, Museum here has no references to Israel. They refuse. You know, the old people there, they know the difference between uh, the Jewish condition and, and what Israel is all about, you know, and they, they, don't, they don't, you know, try to sort of uh, mix the two of them together. Although some, you know, Holocaust Memorial musicians, Museums, you know, like Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, you know, they do try to sort of, you know, say that Israel is the ultimate culmin culmination uh, of uh, Jewish existence after the Holocaust, and the Holocaust justifies, you know, whatever Israel is doing. And they even have a quote, you know, uh, etched in the, uh, the stone um, archway over the entrance to Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. On the inside, and there's a quote from the uh, prophet Ezekiel, which is my middle name, actually. Uh, in English, uh, that prophet is called Ezekiel. And in, uh, in uh, Hebrew, my name is Yecheskel, you know. So this prophet, you know, made one statement saying that the only way to maintain Jewish security is by the establishment of a Jewish state, okay, something like this. And this is what they have up there, you know, etched in stone. But the prophet Samuel, in uh, contrast, in uh, his first uh, book, uh, section 8, uh, paragraph 6 to 20, says, no, the Jewish people are not a nation like other nations. We should be living together with other peoples, and to have a king over us is bad for the people, because a king will make war and uh, will take authority away from, uh, from the deity and claim to be the authority over people, when in fact he has no right to do so. So, mm -hmm. you know, these two traditions, you know, in Judaism, they're sort of, you know, co-mixed, you know, into the editions of the, um, of the Torah that was edited by the uh, guy called Ezra, called Ezra the editor. And he shoved everything in there, you know, from all the different rabbis, from the different tendencies like this, you know, and tried to make a consensus document to unify the Jewish people around the book. But, you know, there's much more to it. You know, like if you go back to the original versions of the Torah, a lot of the uh, junk there about you know, uh, Joshua coming in, you know, to uh, um, uh, uh, genocide, you know, all the people living in uh, Canaan to set up, you know, Eretz Yisrael and all that sort of 
you know, uh, national chauvinism, uh, racism, uh, and, and fascistic, you know, belief, basically. Th that uh, is one tendency, but the other tendency is in the opposite to that. And so um, they're both there in the, uh, in, in the um, you know, Ezra edition of the Torah, you know, with all the other books, subsequent books, you know, after Moses. Moses has five books, you know, that's the Tenach, the, the Pentateuch, Penta meaning five. That's the real Torah. And the other books, you know, from the prophets afterwards, they're contradictory. You know, some are in the tradition of Judaism is set up by Moses, and others, you know, are just a replication of what other peoples and other nations have done because, you know, they want to be a nation like other nations, because they want to be powerful, they want to have more prosperity for themselves by ripping off, you know, other people, making them into uh, servants and slaves, you know. So, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, Judaism is a mixed bag. And uh, the same thing happened, you know, in Islam, you know, there are so many different tendencies, you know, there's the uh, Sunni tendencies, there's the uh, uh, yeah. Shia tendency, the Sufi tendency, the Talifist, you know, Wahhabist tendency, you know, it's complicated, you know, so one has to decide for oneself, oneself just what uh, the belief system is that one wants to propagate and, um, and follow in one's life. And so it's, I think that uh, one should know, be aware of all the various tendencies, what uh, the differences are and what the faults are of each to decide on uh, what is best for oneself uh, to um, advocate to other people and, uh, and to use as a, as a lifestyle. So I think that we're, uh, uh, you know, both aware of this and we're both exploring, you know, what there is uh, to be offered, you know, in all of these uh, systems of thought. And, uh, uh, and uh, also, you know, finding ways to research uh, these matters fuller, more fully in order to find out, you know, what the real story is rather than just hearing cliches and little uh, snippets of, uh, of uh, uh, knowledge that are supposed to be representative, you know, but really only touch the surface of what is actually to be found, you know, beneath. So, um, Let's see now. There is a, a similar movement, uh, uh, which I told you free, uh, previously in Belgium, of uh, Muslims for Socialism and uh, the uh, Jewish Comrades for Socialism, a sister group in Facebook. And they seem to be sort of merging, you know, because uh, there is another uh, Muslim man who uh, I believe had converted to being a a Muslim in Belgium, who uh, has been so inspired by your example that he's figured, you know, that it's so logical to just, you know, proclaim the two as being, you know, uh, integrated and, uh, and so linked historically with one another, that one should not distinguish between the two, because that's a sectarian division that should be overcome. And uh, uh -huh. so, uh, you know, your example provides a way to overcome um, the um, Salafist, Wahhabist, you know, tendency which makes uh, uh, Islam into a uh, into a, a uh, uh, sort of an isolated, segregated group that considers everybody who is not part of the group to be um, inferior. This sense, you know, this hierarchy, you know, this the superior and inferior. Uh, gradations, you know, of religion has to be abolished. And I think that you've accomplished that as an individual and on your own with congratulations. Yeah. And this is being, uh, has inspired, you know, uh, Corneal van Ghent, you know, as well in Belgium to, uh, you know, become a, you know, a member of the, uh, of the Jewish Bund as well as a Muslim. And very good. it's identifying as uh, being Jewish as well. Yes, very interesting. This is like starting a a sort of a tendency, you know, like a movement of uh, a theocratic uh, thought, you know, which is uh, internationalist, non-sectarian, and uh, offers so much, you know, to uh, enable other Muslims to understand what it is to be Jewish truly, and not to be a Zionist. Congratulations, Eric. Thank you. Okay, let's see, uh, let's not make this too long, you know, for people. 
to uh, see what we are uh, up to uh, this week. And uh, let's see, what uh, would you uh, say in conclusion to people? And then we can end this particular session. It's all up to you. Uh, I like to say that um, this is a good one line of work. This is, this is a, we should be uh, uniting as one and uh, to understand, to understand definitely that the Jewish and Zionists are not the same. They're diff completely different things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so next time we'll get into an elaboration of that, okay?